morning, good afternoon, and good evening, everyone. Welcome to Cities on the Frontline, a speaker series co-hosted by the Resilient Cities Network and the World Bank. My name is Lauren Sorkin, and I'm the Executive Director of Resilient Cities Network, and I'm so delighted to be here tonight. This is a, a very special session for us. Um, it's almost exactly nine months since we kicked off this series. And tonight, we're going to be talking about the role of resilience in COVID response and recovery and what we've learned. Um, Francis and I are gonna start off with a little bit of a reflection, sharing with all of you um, some of the, the journey that we've been on and some of the lessons that have come through the presentation. Before I do that, as I always do, <laughs> I'm going to remind everyone of the ground rules for this event. Um, this is a practitioner's event. This is meant for cities, uh, for city staff, and for those partners who are helping cities in their response and recovery uh, from the pandemic. So as such, it's not officially on the record. If you are going to publish what you hear tonight, please reach out to us and then we'll clear that with the speakers from the series. I would also mention that during this series, we have a chat function. So please take a moment, introduce yourself, um, we're so happy to see so many regular participants back here on the line. And also, we are going to open up for Q&A at the beginning of the first half of our session. I'll also give you a little sneak preview. This session is different than other sessions. We're talking about lessons, and we're also talking about taking those lessons right now and applying them to the most urgent issues of our time. So the second half of tonight's session, you're going to hear from the founding members of Resilient Cities Network Racial Equity Community of Practice. So you're in for a really special dual session tonight. Um, and so with that, let me turn it over to Francis and let's take a look at uh, where we've been. Francis? Hey, Lauren. Um, I think by now we all know each other. Uh, but anyway, my name is Francis Gessier. I'm the practice manager for the Urban Disaster Risk Management Land and Geospatial uh, units at the World Bank in the East Asia region of the World Bank. Uh, as you said, Lauren, this is a very special session. Uh, we would like to use it to thank all of you for accompanying us in this journey, uh, but also to hear from you, uh, to hear about uh, what you've learned, uh, what do you think was useful, uh, how the cities on the front line could evolve. We have invited, as uh, Lauren said, two speakers to, to talk about their uh, learning journey and, and how they have been able to apply some of the uh, some of the learning from cities on the front line. And then one concrete example, uh, which is uh, this uh, community of practice on equity. Lauren is going to project, I think, a few numbers. It's been quite. Uh, as I said, quite a journey, 32 session in uh, nine months, quite a few topics, quite uh, a number of, um, uh, of uh, participants. Uh, in fact, 90 speakers in total, about 50% of them men, 50% of them women, more than 3,000 single participants. Some of you have been with us all along, uh, all sorts of uh, topic from witness account to more structured presentation from general accounts to panel discussion, some uh, fun sessions uh, using cartoons and other elements, and then uh, a knowledge platform. And I'm not sure everybody's aware, but everything that is done in Cities on the Front Line is actually recorded, documented. You can have access to it. There's additional uh, material for every one of these topics that, that you guys uh, can access. We are also happy to put you in touch with the various speakers uh, as, we, as we go along. Uh, Lauren, before I go, we, Lauren and I had a, had a little reflection. We, we spent a couple of hours thinking about what we have learned, what were the big lessons learned. But before I get there, I'll, I'll uh, pass it back to Lauren. I think what's exciting is to see this knowledge platform where we've been. Um, and 
uh, as I think folks who have been listening into the series know, um, I I'll often kind of give a reflection from where we are. And I think when we looked out in March of this year at what was going on around the world, we, we wanted to provide a space. We wanted to provide a place for conversation and a place for the honest exchange of information. And now, you know, looking at this knowledge platform and the fact that we've been able to gather lessons from over 30 different topics about how to respond with resilience to different challenges during a pandemic uh, is really exciting. I reflect a little bit on the why and how we got here. Um, and actually, if we go back to the, the former slide, it was it was outreach from Huangshe, and you see the deputy mayor here of Huangshe, which is a city 70 kilometers from Wuhan, who reached out to us when they were initially suffering from COVID and said, we have experience to share. At the same time, um, the CROs around our network, and um, in this case, early on, the CRO from Milan, Piero Palisaro, reached out and said, Milan is gaining cases. We want to know what to do. We want to connect with our network. And it was then that we scheduled with Francis and through the World Bank Network the first uh, the first presentation with lessons from China. Um, and through through that connection uh, and through that space, we've been able to bring knowledge about what cities are doing on the ground at that time. And I think because we've been able to do that. We haven't been limited by any one experience. We've seen experiences from all around the world. We've seen things that cities tried and then needed to do better, right? So we were able to create a space and I'm so glad that we were able to do that because cities could come and practitioners could come and have honest conversations about challenges. Um, and that's really what this has been about um, and creating that space. So as we looked, back at all of the sessions, we were able to see some themes. And I think, Francis, that's what we wanted to share next, really, because all across those 32 sessions and more than um, 90 different presentations, individual presentations, case studies, um, and speakers, there were some pretty clear themes that emerged. There were some pretty clear lessons. So maybe we can go to those next. Yeah, and Lauren, before I uh, share our wisdom, which is our reflection on, on this last nine months, we would like to hear from you. So, but of course, it's very difficult. There are again, more than 100 participants to this session. But we would like to hear from you. And so one thing we would like to propose is that if you could try in one sentence, maybe six words, summarize one of the thing you learn, one of the thing you liked, one of the thing maybe you didn't like about the cities on the front line in the chat section, uh, then we can try to select a few. I'll, I'll try to read a few. Uh, and if we have time, we may even uh, be able to unmute some of you and, and hear from your experience. But as I said, Lauren and I, we had some uh, uh, some reflection on, on the the last nine month, and, and we really felt that the main and the first and most important lessons really from the last six months is that we're all in the same boat. One thing we've absolutely had to learn is that we cannot have one part of society uh, that's suffering while another is not. If one part of a city is contaminated and sick, there is no way the city uh, can uh, continue to thrive. It's really like a ship. If one person, one part of the ship is taking water, the entire ship uh, will sink. And in fact, and that's a fundamental lesson that I think uh, we and, and policymaker, but in fact, we, we are the people who are trying to make a difference, have to integrate in every one of our program. Every one of us would probably be doing it, but this is now an absolute uh, must in, in every program. Other lessons included the fact that communication is essential uh, and crisis communication in particular. We have seen too many examples where communication didn't work and it led to catastrophic results and uh, results where communication was very well handled and it led to very, very uh, positive and well-managed um, cities. 
A third lesson is that, in fact, government still have a role to play. Uh, I think before COVID, there were a lot of people who were pushing for uh, shrinking even more the role of government, trying to get government to get out of the way. I think one clear lesson is that we cannot uh, work without a system to organize us all. Of course, government should replace the private sector, but government has a role to play in coordinating action and effective uh, involvement of the private sector and of public agencies. A fourth lesson is that technology is no longer optional. It's really part of any response, whether it's in advanced economies or in developing countries. Even in the less advanced economies, people now, maybe not the majority, but a, a good share of the population has access to cell phone, to, um, to the internet and to social media. And it would be a mistake not to include technology as part of the equation. I have a fifth one actually, which uh, uh, Lauren, we didn't discuss, but in fact, it's so obvious is that cities are in the front line. Cities are at the center of it all at the end of the day. Uh, and it's not just about responding to pandemic. It's about development in general. Mayors are the people who make things happen on the ground. Uh, cities is where uh, the action uh, takes place. And even if central government have uh, more control over resources, have maybe more control over policies, at the end of the day, it all translates into what is done in cities and how in cities influence the rest of the territory. Uh, and so, in a way, we need to build a resilient system, uh, embrace redundancy rather than uh, systems that are just looking for efficiency and maybe forget some of the people along the way who create you know, systems that are brittle, where one piece is, if one piece is break, the whole system crumble. We need to create redundancy that uh, really create, uh, weave a network, and if one branch breaks, then uh, the rest of the system can continue uh, to function. So these are these were our reflection. We will try to write it down. And we would like to hear your views and your comments. I see that Loy um, uh, wrote, cities are leaders in sustainable development. And Roy has been a great advocate of cities yeah. uh, as a, a system of development. Lauren, do you want to reflect? And then I'm going to try to uh, unmute Roy if I know how to use this platform. I'm not sure yeah. I'll be able to, but. I think that's that's where I wanted us to to turn to the audience and then to our two speakers. So uh, if there are others who want to share in the chat, please do that. Um, and then we can unmute Roy in a moment. And then we are going to turn to two fantastic um, female participants who have been with us. And so let me just take a moment to let you know who you're about to hear from. Um, we have with us tonight. Karina Castillo, who is a resilience coordinator in Miami-Dade. Um, and Karina has been with us for more than 18 sessions. So thank you, Karina. And we're really looking forward to hearing from you. And we're also going to hear from Sam Stratton-Short, who works with Arab International Development Team, and she's based right now in Manila in the Philippines. Um, and so Sam's been with us for 15 sessions. And we took the lessons that we've just shared with you. We shared them with Sam and with Karina, and we asked them, do these resonate with you? What are the lessons that you've learned and how have you actually applied them to your work? So if we are in the for a moment and then we'll turn to our to our speakers. I am not able to find how to unmute. Okay. Right. Why don't we start out? Lori, I have to apologize, yeah. but I'll keep looking. We're gonna go then <laughs> we're gonna go then to Karina to start us off. Karina, the floor is yours. Good 
Thank you. Good morning. Can you hear me? Okay. We can hear you. Go ahead. Okay. Good morning. Thank you so much um, to Lauren and to Francis and really to the Resilient Cities Network and the World Bank for putting on this uh, Cities on the Frontline series. Thinking back to the first one, um, I think we were all in such uncertain territory and we're really looking to find out, um, you know, some of the lessons learned from, from Asia and then, you know, as it moved over to Europe to learn from them in Milan and everywhere. And so, Thank you so much. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, um, everywhere you are. I'm really honored to be here with you, with you today. So I'm Karina Castillo, and I work in Miami-Dade County Office of Resilience. And I'm part of the Resilient 305 partnership that we have with the cities of Miami and Miami Beach. You heard from Amy Knowles in Miami Beach earlier in, the session, um, in one of the sessions talking about their efforts. And so uh, couldn't do it without them and, of course, without the team um, and our own Chief Resilience Officer in Miami-Dade County. So thank you. So um, I wanted to start off and I am, you know, thinking back to um, our own journey in building our resilience um, strategy. And I think that uh, I wanted to talk about how I see shocks really amplifying the stresses. And so a lot of, I think that a good resilience strategy is kind of uh, forewarns us for what's coming. And so with, when COVID hit in Miami-Dade County, it really, we're continuing to see because right now um, we're seeing a rise in the cases again, like much of us in the, across, uh, across the country and in the world. Is that we're 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 learning um, that it's about people and it's about the uh, how people are struggling and so identifying those stresses and making sure while you can't uh, predict everything and you can't predict all the um, the response and and what the situation is going to be and certainly not uh, <laughs> this pandemic uh, I think that knowing that you have your backup and you have this identification. So really going through that process that we did with in, in developing the strategy, and I joined in the latter portion, but I think that it's a great exercise and that's something that I wanted to reflect on. I think I've seen that reflected in a lot of the presentations that all the different speakers have given uh, and really you couldn't have predicted this, but I think having resilience and, and that, that lens of resilience, because resilience is like equity, it's a lens. It's not something that's gonna be on its own, uh, helps you in, in response. So I wanted to talk to you about some of the response that's happening in Miami County. And again, we're not doing this alone. A collaboration is key. We have to rely on both um, our partners uh, in the private sector and the nonprofit sector to help us meet the needs of our community. We're a very large, diverse community. Like um, we have almost 2.8 million people in our county, and there's a lot of need. So in our county, with some of the funding that we got from the federal government, we were able to stand up programs um, to meet, uh, working with our um, partners to meet the needs of small businesses, of making sure that the elderly uh, who were vulnerable and could not go out of their homes were getting home at home meal deliveries. Again, our partners at the Miami of our public school system have not stopped feeding ch children since the beginning of this pandemic. And our superintendent has been out there. Uh, the superintendent of the public school system has been out there making sure that no child was hungry. The county, uh, in collaboration with our state department of health, have been making sure that there's access to testing. You know, they're right now in this picture, you can see a mobile test unit that uh, sets up. In my case, it's a, a local library, but in different locations to make sure that people have access. There's at home, um, at home testing for the elderly. And you just recently, just this week, actually, uh, our new mayor launched a communications campaign uh, we can adapt and we will thrive to make sure that people, especially during this holiday season, when we all want to be close to each other, are taking our understand that, you know, there is an end, hopefully, <laughs> soon in sight um, and that we can do together as a community, come together, take care of each other and take the necessary precautions. But 
you know, and I'm honestly, I think that because we are a um, large, we're, we're a large county and we're on the ground and we know the needs of our community collaboration with our municipalities, we've been able to respond in a way um, where uh, it, it's, it's local, it's, the action is happening here and the many employees from across the municipalities and from across the county who've been, you know, working day and night uh, to, to make sure that our community is moving forward. And so I just wanted to also share that um, in our county, in Miami-Dade County, about uh, in 2016, we were fortunate to benefit from this resilience network where our CROs uh, were able to reach out to Brazil because they had experience with a shock that was not was on our footsteps, Zika. So when that happened, um, the CROs immediately thought, who else, who else, what can we learn? And that shock taught us a lot about um, public, you know, the importance of public health and how that might change, uh, how that shock might come again. And so, it was a little bit of luck that we included an action item in our Resilient 305 strategy that was about advancing pandemic communication and working better together. And the lessons that we learned from the network and then also the lessons that we've learned, uh, we learned from Zika have really, I think, better prepared us. And I think that's the same case for everyone across the network and all the practitioners from all the different cities. You know, every shock teaches you something, and it's about uh, taking those lessons and, and moving them forward. And not only did that Zika experience teach us a lot about, you know, re pandemic response, uh, it also prepared, um, that and uh, some of the other lessons from the Resilient Cities Network pre better prepared our own uh, county government. Our, in last year, this is the cover from our budget book last year, uh, and really, we say in Miami-Dade County that everything we do is about resilience, and it is, uh, so much so that uh, resilience has been integrated to be a part of the budget. And we have uh, the four, you know, goal areas, leadership and strategy, economy and society, infrastructure and environment, health and well-being. And now every moving forward in the coming year, there's a new resilience scorecard where every department in the large county government is going to have to tell us how or share how they're helping build resilience in each of those four uh, pillars. And so having, and you know, being a good friend, and I think our budget director participated in something in the, in the Resilience Cities Network, and she learned some of the lessons about being prepared for the shocks. And so I think I just want to close in saying that um, I'm really grateful to have been a part of uh, 18 sessions in the Cities on the Frontline series. Thank you to Lauren and uh, thank you to Francis and to, of course, um, Lauren, who's our, who's our regional um, or city, uh, resilient cities um, director. So thank you so much. I hope that um, you all have a happy holidays and please stay safe and have a great um, uh, new year. Hopefully 2021 will bring us uh, lots of great things. So well said, Karina, thank you. Really send you to you and to all the participants on the line. I'd encourage everyone to take a look at the chat because there are some really great reflections, lessons being shared from Nigeria to reflections on, on time in Dublin. And something that you really emphasized from those lessons, Karina, was around both those resilient networks providing expertise and exchange, but also on communications and partnership. And so I think those are all really powerful reflections as we move into this next phase. And you said so well, hoping that this next year brings us more, but also knowing that there, there is no going back, right? COVID-19 has changed our cities and our lives forever. Um, and so with that, let, let me give the floor to Sam Stratton Short, Dr. Sam Stratton Short sitting in Manila, Philippines, to speak to us about your experience applying lessons and resilience to your work. Thank you, Lauren. Um, thank you, Karen, for that presentation. And uh, thank you, Francis, and the um, Cities on the Frontline team, uh, and for asking me to share my reflections. Um, I hope you can see. Um, 
Yeah, so um, it is sort of a, a, a real uh, honour to be asked to, uh, to share reflections. I found that this series was absolutely fascinating. Um, 31 sessions, 90 diverse speakers from around the world. Um, and I think that what was really powerful was uh, that there were so many different cities, different contexts, um, different problems being tackled with different interventions. It was an unprecedented time to learn in real time. And, uh, and that goes from medical interventions to what cities are doing. Um, and so I'm, I wanted to reflect on some of the work that uh, I've been doing with the um, Asian Development Bank's Urban Climate Change Resilience Trust Fund. Um, and uh, when I use the uh, word we, I am, uh, I'll be referring to the trust fund as partners with the cities, uh, the Asian Development Bank uh, project officers and, and other uh, as, as the partners as well as the city stakeholders and, uh, and the communities that will, will uh, get a chance to briefly highlight, um, I hope, in this, uh, in this. So just quickly about the trust fund so you know where we're coming from. It's, it's, it's very different um, from, um, from the previous uh, presentation. Um, we, um, this is a trust fund set up uh, seven years ago to look at fast-growing secondary cities in Asia, and it was um, primarily to look at um, helping them with uh, climate risks. Um, but that has been expanded to um, all of resilience, and, um, and it's also been uh, focused on the poor and vulnerable. Um, so the uh, part of the unique work that we've been doing is baselining resilience in um, what's turned out to be 17 of um, over 70 cities, and we have the intention of coming back next year, hopefully, uh, to uh, do an end line measurement and see how the cities have actually responded to, uh, to the interventions. However, uh, in the meantime, uh, we've been uh, almost, I think all of these cities have been facing this COVID crisis in one, one way or another. And um, this, has, uh, this has given us uh, an unprecedented opportunity to really try to understand these cities better. Um, and as part of the trust fund, we have five city resilience officers, nine community resilience officers in six countries covering 23 cities. So um, when uh, COVID happened, the project slowed down and um, due to, um, you know, uh, contact and, and uh, travel restrictions. And so actually we turned their focus on collecting stories of resilience and feeding them um, back to us and back to our stakeholders in the hopes that we could even make better uh, decisions uh, knowing what's happening on the ground. Um, and so, um, as you can see from, from this slide, we had uh, such a, a diverse um, presentation of the, um, the issues that were faced from um, you know, hand washing units being installed, um, uh, public transport transformation, uh, volunteers helping um, get to the frontliners, um, and uh, health access in remote areas in Abbottabad in Pakistan, uh, these interesting rice ATMs in, in Hawaii in Vietnam. And, um, and, 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 and really challenging how um, cities like Bagarat dealt with the, um, the doubling up of Cyclone Amphan uh, whilst they were coping with um, this pandemic. Um, so I think for, for us, uh, it, it goes without question that one of the key uh, themes is, uh, is about equity and how that has um, uh, really um, affected disproportionate parts of the cities. Um, and uh, so again, you know, what we were picking up was, you know, problems with food pr provision, uh, big issues with joblessness, weak healthcare systems um, for for um, the vulnerable, and particularly wage earners, um, those with family responsibilities. Um, and it also picked out how um, there are features of the cities that may have um, made uh, the, the residents more vulnerable, uh, such as overcrowdedness, um, lack of basic services, lack of space, again, food insecurity. Um, and the, the trust fund uses the, the City Resilience Index, which is um, sort of graphically indicated on the right. And I think what's, what's interesting, this was developed with the Rockefeller Foundation in Arab a few years ago. It's been used a lot on the 100 Resilient Cities, so probably many of you are familiar with this. But when we were developing this, we mapped the seven qualities of resilience against all 52 indicators. And what we found was that inclusion uh, actually counted against all 52. So 
five of the seven qualities uh, had a different emphasis uh, on different indicators. But what came across all 52 was that inclusion was, was critical. So that sort of um, predicted what we, what we found in terms of lessons. So just um, briefly touch on some of the other things that did come out as well. Um, I, what, one of them is picking up on, on the fact that, you know, who, who's needed to help with resilience? Is it, uh, you know, do we need government? And, and we certainly found that resilience was, was needed to be uh, worked on with actors at all different scales. So national, city, community, individual, everybody was playing a role in, um, in helping uh, to, to create these, these changes. Um, and 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 I and I, I can't even begin to, to talk about how they all took different different roles at different times, and um, and community was really important in a lot of these uh, these cities in terms of of how they how they pulled through. Um, another uh, point was just uh, it was technology. I thought it was a very bold statement in terms of how important technology is, and I, I would just say I think it probably depends on how you define it, and that a lot of what we're focusing on, on at the moment I would call um, data hungry, energy hungry, vulnerable gadgets, um, where uh, technology has been around for for as long as as as, as we as history has, and it is about. Um, green, uh, green infrastructure, blue infrastructure, it's all of these things that help us build uh, resilience as well as information and that information can be uh, centrally collected or crowdsourced, it, it doesn't matter, it, it is important and it will help us. Um, we we also uh, we did we did find um, in, in in many of the places that uh, in terms of of inclusion, um, uh, financial inclusion was it was was a gap um, that was um, that, that really became apparent. Um, the, the fact that you know, in, in a cashless uh, environment, people didn't have access to their own bank accounts. They, um, um, you know, they just they didn't have uh, the the ability to to access the same things that others did. Um, and then uh, the the final point um, that that sort of has been resonating across all the the, the lessons and, and transferring itself into to tools that, that we're trying to share with cities going forward is about the the importance of of prevention. And I think that prevention really ties in with resilience because it's not just about response. Um, I think that's the, the beauty of resilience is that it's it's about anticipation and 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 trying to avoid things. And I and I think that you know we hear a lot about uh, the response to COVID. When, when what we're all about is, is how we build on this and we're ready for the next one. And, um, and so many of the issues that we uh, see are things that could be, could be prevented, certainly could be um, largely mitigated if we put in place things like um, basic uh, water services, sanitation, all of these things that at the moment too many people are going without and this affects their health. And I, and I couldn't agree more uh, with your comment, Francis, about the fact that uh, this should really, um, this situation should really expose how interconnected we all are and that if you have parts of your city that are not healthy, then basically the city isn't resilient, the city isn't healthy and, and everyone is going to feel it. And it's, it's a real call, um, you know, to, to action for everybody to, to you know, to, to be inclusive, to, to, to work together. But, um, but overall, this has been, um, I mean, we, we have been in a really privileged position to, to see a lot of inspiring stories from these cities um, and, uh, you know, ultimately about, you know, human, human strength and, and uh, ingenuity and, and looking after each other. So, thanks. Thanks, Sam. There was so much in there from all of the different lessons, and I think you summarized very well at the end with that framing that we need to be inclusive because there is no resilience without equity. Now, I think one of the beauties or perhaps the most exciting thing about leading a practitioner's network, this magic is that you don't have to wait a long time for knowledge to translate to practice and to affect change on the ground. And in reality, we don't have time to waste right now. Um, so as we pivot to this next part of the, the discussion tonight, I, I really wanted to say that, you know, I couldn't be, be more inspired and more humbled by some work that is now coming up in the Resilient Cities Network. Um, and that is to share knowledge and to address a fundamental equity issue. And this has come up from the ground up um, from our North American cities to address racial equity. 
And so just as we transition, and I'm going to hand it off in just a moment to our director for North America, Lorian Farrell, I want to just share a quote, quote from, from the, the great Barbara Jordan, who was the first African-American congresswoman to be elected from the state of Texas. Um, and I'm, I'm going, going to change it just a little bit to make it more about cities, um, for those of you who are familiar with her and her, her speech, um, who, who will then speak for the common good. And she said, we are people in a quandary about the present. We are people in search of our future. We are people in search of community. We are trying not only to solve the problems of the present, unemployment, illness, but we are attempting on a larger scale to fulfill the promise of our cities. We are attempting to fulfill our purpose to create and sustain a society in which all of us are equal. So in that spirit of no equity, no resilience, let me hand it off to you, Lorianne, to take us to the next part of the panel. Thank you, Lauren. Thank you so much. What a perfect quote to segue into this really exciting topic that we have to share with you today. Today is a tremendously important day for the community of practice on racial equity through resilience. Uh, we are here today to tell you about the group that we have formed, the work that we, were, we are doing, this important mission, and, and we welcome you to join us in this work. Our community of practice on racial equity through resilience arose in 2020 for a very specific reason. Uh, we came together motivated, not just motivated, actually compelled by the murder of George Floyd in the city of Minneapolis. And Ron Harris, uh, the Chief Resilience Officer from Minneapolis is here with us today, one of our founding members. members. And he has an important story to share. Um, we started very intentionally as a small group of um, of chief resilience officers, city practitioners, and some invited members from the private sector. Um, in the spirit of a community of practice, we knew we needed to start small, build trust, to be able to have some very difficult conversations with each other, um, and to really lay the foundation for the work that we want to do as we move forward. Um, and and we, we surely know that this work on uh, racism, systemic racism, is not just an issue that is happening that we need to address in the United States. It is a global issue, and we saw this by the, the overwhelming global response um, and unrest and protesting in nations across the world after the murder of George Floyd this year. Um, and we know that you have so much information and knowledge to share with us, and, and we, we need all hands on deck to be able to tackle this problem. It's been said a few times in this call already, and I've seen it in the chat, uh, but we also know that a city that is not equitable will never truly be resilient. So as resilience practitioners, this is where we need to be focusing our efforts. And we know that people are looking for the truth in this moment, and people are starting to be ready to have some very difficult conversations if we're going to get to the root causes of our problems. So our intention as a group is very practical. We want to be um, looking at the systems within our cities that um, are, are causing us the problems, and we need to be dismantling systemic racism, the systemic racism that exists across our policies, our practices, um, and we need to tackle those problems head on. So we are practitioner-led, and we are practice-based. And we would invite you to take a look at our brand new website uh, that just went live this morning if you want to learn more about our practice and how you can um, contribute and join us in this, in this movement. So with that, I would like to introduce our panelists today. Uh, I mentioned Vaughn Harris from the city of Minneapolis. We're also joined by Megan Sparks from the city of Atlanta and Michelle Farrell, who joins us from Toronto, Canada. Michelle is a lawyer and an advocate and a fine example of how we can partner with people outside of our network to bring in more resources, more expertise. Michelle is also my sister and I'm very happy to be here with her today. Um, so let's, let's turn this over to the panel now. Um, one of the things I really wanted to do to share with you all are these amazing stories of our panelists um, and how they were inspired to come to this work and why did we decide to focus on uh, racial equity through resilience because I think that's a very important important point um, that grounds and focuses our work. Um, so Ron, why don't I ask you to turn on your camera? Um, I can't see you if you have it on yet. Actually, let me ask all of the panelists to turn on their cameras and to unmute. And Ron, let's start with you. 
Hey, good morning, everyone. Uh, thank you to the Resilient Cities Network and all the partners who have hosted all these conversations over the last few months. I'm excited to be a part of the very last one, and I'm also excited to share with you all um, the racial equity through resilience community of practice that I now have the opportunity to, to chair. Um, as was mentioned by Lorian, uh, and as you all know, um, George Floyd was murdered in my city. Um, and that really is just a culmination of years and years and years of underlying systemic racism that not only threatens us in the present, but certainly threatens our, our livability and our um, wellness for the future, right? And I think for a lot of folks, um, pre-pandemic, right, pre-George Floyd's murder, there were still a lot of people who were suffering. And I think for a lot of us, we were kind of blind to that. You know, and now once George Floyd was murdered, once COVID-19 hit, right, it brought to bear just how many people around the world really weren't, weren't sharing in the goodness and sharing in the riches of their own countries, right? Um, when COVID-19 hit, you know, even, even a disease, even a virus that has no intelligence whatsoever, the results are still racist, right? The results are still systemic. We know that in the U.S., black and brown folks are two to three times more likely to not only catch COVID-19, but die from COVID-19. We also know that those same people are most likely to be what we call essential workers who had to go and show up to work every single day during the pandemic without good, without adequate pay, without access to insurance, right? If you're, if you're one of those folks, you're also more, you know, more likely to live in uh, less affordable housing, right? Less likely to have good transit. So if you go down the list, one of the reasons why we really wanted to center racial equity through resilience is that resilience is all about building back better. Resilience is all about bouncing forward. And we made the clear point that we cannot bounce forward without ensuring that, the, that those who are at the most risk, at the most vulnerable, um, aren't prioritized. Right, we will never be resilient without equity. Um, Minneapolis is a, is a prime example, right? We've had, you know, a century of underlying uh, systemic racism. And once George Floyd was murdered, what it really showed all of us is that this work is also intersectional, that we can't just isolate and solve for one problem without ensuring that we don't uh, bake in equity in our approaches. So for me, um, when he was murdered, it just inspired me to approach resilience a little bit differently. Resilience in so many places is really about environmentalism and making sure that buildings are ready for climate change and all those things. And none of that stuff should be ignored. And what is equally threatening to us are inequity in our cities, right? That we're not gonna be able to tackle climate change if a whole segment of our population can't thrive during good times, right? We, we're never gonna be able to tackle these big problems if we're not focused on equity. And so when George Floyd was murdered and we saw all of these corporations putting out statements and dedicating funds and talking about how they're down for anti-racism and all these things, what we found was that there was no framework for how that work was done, right? There was no framework for how we partner with those and shaping those commitments and shaping those, that money and shaping those um, intentions, right? And so we wanted to bring up resilience as, a, as an entry point, as an opportunity for people to see themselves as part of building back better and, and, and knowing that we cannot build back better if we don't first repair past injustices. Um, I, won't, I won't keep going because we still got a little bit more time in the panel, but um, that was the impetus for the beginning of this group. That was the origin story that as practitioners, we play a very, very specific role in this moment and in this movement, right? We have activists who are on the ground, you know, sacrificing their bodies, saying that Black Lives Matter, pushing against the system, calling out these things. But as practitioners, we play a specific role in translating that message and making sure that that message um, is heard by everybody across the world. And it shows that everybody has a role in this not just resilience practitioners, not just equity directors, not just activists. All of us have a role in this in this system. Thank you, Ron. Michelle? Hi. Um, good morning, everyone. I'm really uh, humbled and proud uh, to be here, excited. <clears throat> I'm speaking to you from lands that are situated on traditional territories and um, treaties. And um, uh, from one of the uh, most diverse cities on the globe with real ties to different economies across the world through our very large newcomer population. Um, and so in that context, um, I wanted to let you know that um, Toronto is a great city and we have a reputation in Canada for being kind and gentle and getting everything right. And in my work over the past 30 years um, within legal systems, trying to confront issues of equity. I can tell you that we are kind, uh, but there are still plenty of inequitable outcomes 
that happen in, in our city and I'm sure in others. And it's really not for a lack of good policies here. It's not for a lack of good legislation here. It's because of how systems tend to function and because of these phenomenons uh, that uh, um, impact our citizens. Racism is a pretty significant phenomenon. And I think across the world, we have very concrete evidence for that fact. And so for me, it is just wonderful to have been invited to talk to this group of people, to, to uh, connect my skills and my experiences in within legal systems to to the actual community of practitioners. As Lauren said in her opening, it doesn't take very long for actual impact to happen when you have these right connections. Um, so this group of people knows how cities work, and you know how some of these systems that affect my clients um, could possibly be changed in a very real, visceral way. And so I'm here in this community practice, and I've had a wonderful experience so far with this, uh, you know, w listen, the, the discussions we're having are tricky, they're complicated, they're nuanced, and we are building a community of trust that I think um, you would love to be part of. Um, I'm really here to get inspired, but I already have been. And, and I'll leave it at that. I'm so grateful um, for the assistance that I get in my daily work by being part of these calls. And I really, truly believe that being a part of this community of practice has made an impact on my ability to influence others. Yes, thank you, Lorian, and um, thank you to my fellow panelists as well as to our host today. On behalf of Mayor Bottoms, and we really appreciate Atlanta being included in the conversation, and we're very happy to be here. Um, for me, you know, this community of practice is just that. It's a community which offers a lot of support for the work that we've been doing on the ground every day. Atlanta is known worldwide as a civil rights hub. Um, and we know that that doesn't just mean that we're a symbol. That doesn't mean that we're perfect. That means that we grapple with the really hard work and conversations each and every day. Um, we also have people across our city, myself included, who look like I do, frankly, who are white people who are looking for their space in this movement, who want to be really active and strategic allies. And one message I really wanted to carry today is this is also a space of practice. The community offers you support. The practice is a very real action verb. We're all working hard. We're grappling. If you join us, you'll see that we're having these hard conversations, like Michelle said. And you do have a place in this movement. You do have a space. For me, I have come to resilience, actually, through racial equity rather than the other way around. And the reason I think resilience is so powerful as a framework to achieve racial equity in our cities, whether you're in North America or elsewhere around the world, is it offers us this model of connectivity. We know whether it's the curb cut effect or the model of rising boats, and we are in this together. And those who suffer the most are the symbol of how healthy our communities are. If we improve our systems and our communities for those who are suffering, who we know in cities around the world are generally, the darker you are, the more you are suffering at the hands of our systems. Um, if you improve things for them, that improves for everybody. Um, so that's why I'm here today, and I really thank you for having me. Thanks, Megan. And uh, Michelle and Megan, I just wanted to follow up with you uh, on one point um, in the next you know, two minutes. Can we talk a little bit about specifically why this community of practice on racial equity through resilience chose to focus, to be laser focused actually, on anti-black racism in this moment. Because we know there are there are so many, so many facets, so many layers to racism, so many different types of racism. Um, but we were very intentional and uh, when in building our foundation that at this moment, um, anti-black racism is where we need to start in, in the United States especially, but also it's an important conversation for the global context. Um, and I'm thinking particularly about the curb cut effect that we've talked about a lot. Um, and so I just was hoping you could share with the audience a little bit about that decision and, and, the, and the reasoning rationale behind it. Sure. Michelle, would you like to go first? Michelle, you have to just unmute. 
Thank you. I'm sure it'd be um, much more insightful if you can actually hear me. Um, Megan, um, uh, there is always too much to say in this answer. So uh, I'm going to do my best in, in a minute. And um, and I, I trust that you'll pick up some of the gaps. But uh, I think I'll answer this from a personal perspective. I began my career um, um, as an advocate in my 20s at a college um, interested in diversity and equity. And uh, my first job was as a counselor for students with disabilities, doing advocacy around disability issues on my campus, where we were literally going to find the curb cuts. That was what we were doing. And I would leave students in the middle of the road going, oh, okay, we can't go anywhere. And unfortunately, it was a very pleasant campus. Um, there was no traffic, so they weren't in danger. But what, where, I, where, my conver where my thinking has evolved over the past 30 years is not much has changed. This is not a new conversation. The world just didn't realize that Black people exist in 2020. Um, but in this moment of time, because of what we saw globally in response to the police shooting of George Floyd, and let me just jump in and say I was counsel to the chief of a major city police. Toronto is one of the largest uh, centers. We have a huge police service here. We were having these conversations to eradicate these problems 20 years ago. Nothing changed. And so my belief now is that we have a moment in 2020 to be laser focused on one aspect of racism. Um, I mentioned to you that I'm coming to you from Toronto. We're aware that there's a great deal of anti-Indigenous racism here in Canada. Um, but if we focus on this aspect of anti-Black racism now, because the moment is here, because we have people aware in a different way, um, I believe that we will raise, like Megan said, we will we will raise the lot levels for everyone. And why not use this community and the outcomes for this community as an as an effective litmus test to see if our systems are actually working? Because what we have been implementing with good intentions for decades didn't work. So we've got to do something different. Yes, exactly. I think the answer is relatively simple, Lauren. Why anti-blackness? It's because those are the people who are suffering the most, um, who our systems, especially in the United States, are discriminating against the most, who they are disadvantaging the most. Even in Atlanta, which is known as a black city, a black mecca, it is our residents who are black, our communities of color particularly, that have higher rates of COVID infection, who are losing their jobs at higher rates, who are losing their homes at higher rates, who are being forced out of the city and displaced. And it's because I think as a community of practice, one thing we decided early on is that we were gonna be vulnerable and we were gonna be a place of truth. Um, and that's one reason that it is such a valuable group personally to me to come to you every week, as well as, you know, I think all of you when you join and our partners um, regularly, I have corporations and other foundations who are very interested in social justice and racial equity coming and saying, how can we help you? How can we help the mayor? We want to be involved in equity. And that's what they're looking for is truth. It is sometimes hard to say, but it is like we've all know our the darkest people are suffering the most. And if we start with anti-blackness and really seize this moment in time, as Michelle was saying, then we can improve systems for everybody. And so on that note, let me turn it back to Ron. Um, this is Ron, as the chair of our COP, you have a call to action that you want to share with everyone um, about how they can, can participate and join us. Absolutely, you know, that curb cut effect, right? Like when you build in a curb cut in the community, not only does it benefit the ADA community, right? Those in a wheel, who are wheelchair bound or have disability and moving, it also benefits everybody. It benefits the person who's learning how to ride a bike for the first time. It benefits the father who is pushing his kid in the stroller. So when we focus on those who are suffering the most, I believe in a trickle up activism, right? A cascading effect that um, everybody will benefit if we target the most uh, marginalized and the most vulnerable. Um, and as you know, as a community of practice, we have actually been preparing for your arrival, right? We've been thinking about you before you've shown up. Um, I, I believe this is our opportunity to shift from a passive uh, non-racism to an active anti-racism, right? Our goal is to support not only urban practitioners working in cities who are tasked with doing this work, 
but we also want to support the other folks, right, the other partners, other people who are in the industry who have a renewed commitment to making a difference, right? We recognize that we cannot do this work alone. Although cities are unique laboratories of innovation and, and laboratories of democracy, cities can't do this alone, right? Cities can be leaders in this effort, but we need to build the kinds of partnerships, multi-sector partnerships, bringing in academics, bringing in corporate funders, bringing in other partners who are committed to doing this work. Um, this, this group is in this community is also about inspiring other people to contribute to systems change, right? I think that this is an opportunity for us to redefine what it means to be a change agent, that it's not only the responsibility of those who are formally tasked with this work, it is a shared responsibility um, for all of us to step up. So I am encourage you to go to the website to get some more information. Um, we are just starting as a community and we are a community of practice, which means that we are learning together. Um, so I encourage you to go to the website, um, check out more information, we've written some articles about this work, and just stay tuned. Um, and I appreciate you all for being here. I'll pass it to Lorian to close us off. Thank you. And, and, and I'm going to turn it over to Lauren in, in just 30 seconds so that we can end on time today. But I want to thank you, Ron, Michelle, Megan, uh, for bringing your voices, for bringing your expertise, for bringing your vulnerability. Um, and I think that it's an important point to note that this community of practice is just that. It's a community of practice. It, we're going to learn as we go along together. Um, it's a place for us to be vulnerable, um, to speak the truth and, and make mistakes, but also make amazing progress. So please go to the website. Um, share with your partners, share with potential funders. If you, if you know of groups that will be interested in supporting this work, that's extremely important. Um, and, and we cannot wait to get to work with you. So thank you very much for your, your time this morning um, and, and go in peace, everyone. Thank you so much, Lorian. Thank you, Michelle, Megan. Thank you, Ron. Um, I also wanna thank again, uh, Karina and also Sam for your incredible insights um, and, uh, of course, I would be remiss if I didn't thank Francis, because the first email I sent about creating this space um, to the World Bank, Francis was the one who responded. In the midst of everyone going crazy and trying to deploy hundreds of millions of dollars, in fact, billions of dollars of World Bank assistance, everyone else said, sorry, I'm too busy. And Francis said, no, this is important. We need to create a knowledge sharing space. Um, and so he's been my partner in all of this. We've sat together on, you know, tens of sessions um, facilitating, and it's been wonderful. I wanted to close with some no news about where we go from here and actually take the opportunity to respond to one of the questions that's in the chat here, um, and it's from Catherine Klein, um, and it's how do local and municipal leaders implement lessons learned when their governors or presidents hold power and resist these efforts? And I think that comes back to the fact that cities are still on the front line, and they are going to be on the front line going forward. So we reached out to all of you and we asked you, what would be helpful to continue this work on response and recovery? What would be helpful in terms of sitting in the front lines? And we heard very clearly that you actually want us to stay with the series. You want to look at broader issues of urban resilience. And so we're going to do that. We're going to keep the series going next year, and we're going to focus in on COVID-19 response and recovery and then what happens next? So a post-shock world, what does it mean holistically to build urban resilience? And if we can go to the next slide, I'll also speak to how we're gonna do that. So we're going to keep our focus on practitioner case studies, and we're going to continue to be absolutely adamant about having a diversity of speakers from across regions, genders, um, and we're going to keep regular meetings. So we're going to continue these series about every other week. We will start up again on the 21st of January. Our next series is going to be on building child-friendly cities and how creative governance can facilitate citywide approaches to play. This is going to be co-organized with the Real Play Coalition and will feature the winner of a recent challenge about play, the city of Tirana. So with that, um, I wanted to say thank you to all of you, but not goodbye, um, to say farewell, that you should continue to access the learning in the next few weeks, but also take some time to rest, have healthy, safe, and pleasant holidays. And let me open it up to Francis if you wanted to say anything else in closing before we sign off tonight. Echoing everything you say and echoing, and especially thanking you, Lauren. This has been, uh, as I said, a fascinating journey. 
you really led us all in this process. I, I feel I, I played a supporting uh, role, maybe a, um, and, and a fascinating supporting role. It was great. And I'm very happy we're continuing this experience. Uh, and I really uh, wish everybody would continue to uh, to be with us in this in this journey, but also wish everybody a uh, happy holiday, happy new year. Uh, I think everybody deserves uh, a good rest, uh, not only deserve, but uh, has the obligation of taking a rest because we're still in this uh, crisis for quite a while and the mission will continue for quite a while uh, and will probably never be resolved, entirely resolved, but uh, uh, it's important to refresh, take care of our families and then come back to the mission and, uh, and uh, continue. So, not much, not so inspiring, but uh, thank you everyone for joining us. It's, uh, it's as interesting for us, I hope, as it is for you. Thank you, Lauren. Thank you so much. And with that, just wishing everybody again, very safe, happy, healthy holidays and looking forward to working and moving onwards in resilience together in the new year in 2021. Thanks everyone. Thank you.